Members, it's time now for questions to the Minister for Education, and I call Colin McGrath. One, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Like the member for his question, my focus is on achieving a return to face-to-face -face education for all children, and I reluctantly must accept that some activities associated with schools that have a somewhat higher risk due to mixing within and between year groups, such as school sports, must remain paused at the moment. These activities will therefore remain paused until public health advice permits them to recommence. There are many issues around the return to school, including sport, and these will form part of the wider executive uh, considerations. Indeed, the next stage of that will be tomorrow. The resumption of sport forms part of the executive's pathway out of uh, restrictions. Opportunities for children and young people to participate in sports and school sports helps them build upon the knowledge and skills they develop through the PE curriculum. Schools often build effective relationships with communities they service through the medium of sport. Community use of sports, uh, school sports facilities makes an important contribution to community cohesiveness as well. So I recognise that participation in physical activity, both inside and outside of school, makes an important contribution to the well-being and personal development of all our young people. That's why I'm keen to see a return to sport as soon as possible. I call Colin McGrath for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and um, I welcome some of the remarks that the Minister makes. Um, I suppose I mean, sports are outdoors, they are good for physical health, they are good for mental health, they give an opportunity to mix, but could be socially distanced. So could I ask the Minister, is there any form of planning being taken place to see if sports could be introduced, but in a safe manner that could see, I mean, it does not automatically have to be team-based sports, uh, it could be sports that allow people to participate, uh, but at the same time it could happen a bit quicker. I take on board very much as I suppose um, uh, maybe they're looking to this house. We're not always on the same team uh, in that regard. So team-based sports are always a little bit uh, uh, a bit of a dubious issue in that regard. Yeah, look, I think that, that as we will see in terms of the broader return to education, um, that will be in part as well on the basis of a range of mitigations that we put in place. And I think the same can be done in terms of sports. Uh, I think that, that perhaps there is a slight level of misunderstanding out there among some people because. When the Pathways document was produced, it put um, school sports, for instance, specifically at, at uh, strand four of that, but then mentioned within uh, the, the wider sports side of it, uh, on it being at, at strand two. Those, those two can move along um, together, and I would be, I believe it is important that if we are seeing, for instance, a movement in terms of sport, that, that also includes school sports. That's why, for instance, specifically, when reference was made on the issue of um, spectators, there was then a specific exemption that was put in place, or a particular provision put within the Pathways document, on a, allowing um, a level of spectators at uh, school events on that basis as well, because I think it's important that, that balances it. I think from that point of view, it's important that we move as quickly as possible to that resumption of sports activities, uh, and I think whatever mitigations that need to be put in place, I think can be examined. Obviously, it will be dependent upon what information the executive receives as a whole from public health and from the Department of Health in terms of those, those mitigations. But um, as opposed to use, uh, the interlinkage between the two to use, um, in my uh, own old school motto, at least a part of the, the old school song was Sano Mens Incorporate Sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. And the interlinkage between the two um, is important, not just for the physical advantage of our young people, but actually the impact on things like mental health and wellbeing is critical as well. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The impact of school closure and uh, the closure of youth sport has been severe on children and young people. So, can I welcome the planned resumption of outdoor sport training and games without spectators in phase two of the executive COVID recovery plan? And can I ask the Education Minister to work with his executive colleagues to ensure a coordinated response to the resumption of both school and club sport as soon as possible? Would very much. I know, I know the, the, the member, as well as being chair of the education committee, has a strong interest in sports. Um, we come from a very strong sporting background, and I think it is important in giving that that wider context to uh, our young people. I'm very happy to work with. I think everything that we should be doing as much as possible should be coordinated and through a level of, of cooperation. And clearly, if we're talking about education, we're talking about sport. There is that strong nexus between the two uh, between the, the departments involving communities, involving health, involving education. So uh, I'm certainly happy to give that commitment of working um, towards that. And I think, uh, I think 
whatever sport we follow, for instance, I think one of the pities that we will see, for instance, the next week, I mean, many of us will have associated with our own particular sports, uh, St. Patrick's Day as being sort of a great school sporting occasion. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see that this year. But the sooner that we can resume those activities uh, and have that benefit to all our young people, I think the better. I call Morris Bradley. Mr. Speaker, uh, and, uh, I welcome the, the minister's, minister's announcement to return to sport. But could I ask the minister, uh, does he see a possibility of opening the school estates to youth clubs and community organisations over the summer months uh, to work with children uh, who attend schools and sometimes are members of the same clubs to make sure that the, the time lost in physical education can be made up over the summer months? Yeah, very much so. Like, I know that there, there is good interaction where we have our schools and wider community organisations working together. And in particular, um, we see that in the sporting context. There will quite often be a scenario in which quite a lot of school sports grounds are also linked in with a, a local sort of community uh, sports facility. It is important, and I will be bringing forward proposals to the executive in terms of a wider recovery package for our young people and education. Um, and clearly, while there will be focus on the academic side of it, there will be focus on the broader um, well-being and mental health side of it. Clearly, having a level of physical activity, particularly over the summer, will be critical. And I think, as part of that, that overall package, which will hopefully run throughout the year, there will be specific activities targeted in at the, at the summer months. And I hope that by that stage, we'll be in a position in which uh, the vast majority of restrictions, uh, the things will have moved on to the extent that those can be lifted. And that level of coordination, I think, between the community. Um, and schools can be done, particularly in the, the sports field. You know, I'm acutely aware that there are also things which can be delivered, be it through a sports club or a community-based organisation, um, which can take it over and above what can be directly delivered within schools. And I know there's a number of initiatives which have happened down the years, uh, and I'd be keen to see those embraced during the summer months. Moving on, I call Jonathan Buckley. Question number two. The the intention uh, of the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act, uh, Northern Ireland 2016, the Act, is to provide greater consistency in how all schools respond to bullying incidents and allegations, ensuring that all pupils are being protected to the same best practice standards. This is an important piece of legislation. It builds on schools' existing duty of care for their pupils and strengthens the protection pupils can expect if they experience bullying in schools. The Act which will commence on the 1st of September of this year, will provide a common definition of bullying. It will require all schools to centrally record incidents of bullying, their motivation and their outcome, and require each school's Board of Governors collectively to take greater responsibility for the development, implementation, monitoring and periodic review of the school's anti-bullying policies and procedures. The recording requirements of the legislation will also allow schools to monitor patterns and trends of bullying and ensure uh, instances of bullying will be addressed promptly and effectively. Well, Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I am sure he will agree with me that bullying is a scourge in our society, and in particular in our classrooms. Uh, it has a devastating and long-lasting impact on any child as they go out throughout their life. So, Can the Minister perhaps elaborate on what duty will this uh, particular piece of legislation impose upon boards of governors? I thank the member for his answer, and I agree with him in terms of the longer-term uh, impact that bullying can have on individuals. Uh, I think one of the things that we are sadly seeing, which is difficult in terms of the reach of any form of legislation, will be the level of bullying that will take place entirely outside of the remit of the, the school. And we see sort of what happens in terms of um, the social media side of things. But specifically in terms of uh, boards of governors, as a corporate body, boards of governors are legally responsible for all decisions and actions taken uh, in its name by individual governors, the principal, or the committees to which they have delegated functions. So the Act will place a statute of duty on the Board of Governors to determine the detailed measures to be taken at a school to prevent bullying, ensure that they are properly implemented and are kept under periodic review, so it should be at least every four years to ensure that they are fit for purpose. And the legislation will require a review at intervals not exceeding four years. Governors will be actively involved in developing and monitoring the effectiveness of their schools anti-bullying policy, because it's important that not simply is this a policy that sits on the shelf, but one that is directly implemented. I think they'll also be better informed uh, to support or indeed challenge how an incident has been handled by staff. And I believe in many ways, as I mentioned, that this was dealing with 
best practice um, for most schools will have in place already um, policies as regards bullying, because I think it's important uh, that that is the case. So a lot of schools are very proactive in this front. I suppose this is just creating a situation in which we ensure that best practice is shared across the system. I call Orlea Flynn. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. Um, I would like to ask the Minister, I know you had mentioned there are some of the guidance and direction for the schools. Will there be any additional support um, given towards schools and principals in uh, how they are going to fulfil their obligations to implement in this legislation? I am just asking that question, obviously, given the challenges and the pressures that the school environments are under um, at present with the pandemic. Thank you. I understand that. Well, look, we will give as much support and guidance that, that can be done. So, guidance have been, has been developed to accompany the Act, and it has been designed to think it is also important that this is not something which is simply imposed from on high. But in terms of the input, we have had considerable work um, in working out the implementation, for instance, with the teacher unions to make sure that that, that is fit for purpose. And also, I suppose, had significant impact from teachers and wider educational professionals so that what is there is fit for, for uh, present. So, for example, while there is opportunities for schools to develop whatever recording requirements, uh, the methodology in relation to that, there will be a bullying incident recording system that has been developed on C2K for schools, should they wish to, to use that. And also, the Education Authority um, has provided training and online resources uh, for schools and their governors. I think it is also important that, in doing so, we also ensure that uh, while we have a strong system and one which then protects um, our young people through this, that it does not become an additional um, administrative burden. So we believe that, that the online recording of this can mean that this can be done that will not uh, significantly add to any administrative burden that would be there from, from schools. But in many ways, I suppose this is about a, a belt and braces approach because we believe in trying to create probably a very similar approach because the vast bulk of schools will have a level and have procedures in place already anyway. So hopefully we are simply building on good practice. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, can I thank you for your answers so far? Minister, often bullying, whilst an abhorrent action, masks underlying issues with the perpetrator. Given that the victim unequivocally deserves every support, what steps will be taken to reform and educate the perpetrator? I think what we will have is individual cases, and I think that it is important, first of all, that that level of support is given to the, the victim of, of bullying. Um, I suppose there is not always a one-size-fits-all type situation as regards that, and there will need to be individual interventions to take place uh, within that. Clearly, uh, I think one of the issues which needs to be uh, is indeed good education that will happen in the classroom to try to prevent this happening in the first place. Because again, rather than trying to deal with the consequences of something, if we can try and um, ease that at the, the start, that I suppose, in, in terms of that, will also then go down uh, both in terms of the guidance that will be there, but also actually will, will play to the particular actions that a school will take in terms of its own policy, which will be developed by governors, and they will want. And I think teachers are, are wise enough to know what levels of interventions are there. Part of the um, it is also important was why, for instance, the motivation is one of the areas that will be. Uh, recorded as part of this, it is important then for a school to see where there are potential trends. So, if, for example, uh, they are seeing is there a particular problem with, with racism, for example, or misogyny, or whatever, that, that they will be able to actually have a bit of a, a data capture, at least they will be able to see where this is coming from, and hopefully then be able to target any actions to try and deal directly with the problem. And I call Jerry Carl. Number three. Thank you, Member, for his question. Uh, my department always already operates a policy of maximum class sizes for children in the foundation stage and key stage one, as well as for practical subjects within the curriculum. In regard to educational attainment, the, evidence, the available evidence suggests that except in the very early years, class size reduction does not have a significant impact on student outcomes, and the main driver of the variation in pupil learning uh, at school is the quality of teaching that would be provided. Small reductions in class sizes are unlikely to be cost-effective relative to other strategies. Other interventions, uh, such as individual or small group tuition, provided uh, to those most in need through my department's Engage programme, are likely to have a greater impact. Uh, using normal formative assessment approaches within the classroom, schools will work to understand where pupils are in regard to their learning after the period of remote, remote learning. 
I am confident that schools will identify and support those pupils who are most likely to experience difficulties in engaging with learning. However, I fully recognise there will need to be a plan for and fund on ongoing evidence-based uh, interventions to support schools to limit the long-term effects of the current disruption. So I plan to bring forward proposals for a further support programme for a range of educational settings to uh, the Executive shortly, and that will build on the work of the Engage programme in 2021, subject to Executive agreement and availability of funding. I call Jerry Carr for supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer. And I think maybe there's an assertion that they don't have a, an impact smaller class sizes on education may be disputed. Uh, they're obviously important to protect people uh, through the, the virus, can enhance learning, uh, allowing for more one-to-one -one assistance, can also be better for those with learning disabilities, people with sensory issues, and so on and so forth, and better, uh, I would and many others would say, for education overall. Uh, will the Minister look at, uh, commit to look at international best practice where there are smaller class sizes in other countries? and to see if we can implement those uh, measures here. Thank you. I say there was no impact at all. What I'm saying is I think if we're looking at interventions, particularly on the academic side of it, uh, there's a limited amount of evidence that outside of um, the early years that it makes a particular significant difference. As with all things, it is a matter, uh, but I take on board as well, for example, where there are learning difficulties, where there is issues regarding special educational needs. There is then, and there is within process, um, a situation where there can be that one-to-one -one interventions, and particularly if we look, for instance, at the point of view of somebody who has statemented, with that statement will require, a, will uh, retain a level of um, particular intervention for that individual. So it may well be, for example, that that will mean that there will be a particular classroom assistant that will be assigned to an individual, and I think that's the right way of, of tackling it. In terms of the broader issue on class sizes and looking at, at, at best practice, again, as part of this, um, you know. I will look to try to ensure that we get the best results for the level of investment and resources that are available. But if we were to move to, for instance, a situation in which there are much smaller class sizes, that would require a high level of, of resource intense commitment. And I can only allocate ultimately what's within the education budget. It is likely, while we are in the position that, that we are at draft budget stage still, that the overall budget next year for education, outside of particular COVID interventions, is likely to be fairly close to being flatlined on cash terms. That will mean I do not think there will be a radical change within that. But I am also looking at where the interventions can take place in the best possible way. I will also look as part of that, um, and we are due by this summer also to have the report of the expert panel on uh, education under achievement. And I, th I will study closely whatever um, recommendations are made from that and try to ensure that as much as possible that they are implemented as well. I call Carl Nicolin. And thank the Minister for his response um, thus far, um, and indeed for Jerry bringing the question forward. Could you confirm, Minister, as part of your priorities in bringing um, proposals forward to the Executive, that you will look at capital prioritisation of children who are being educated in porta cabins that were supposed to be temporary are now going to attack kids, particularly children who have been statemented? In terms of uh, position, because I think particularly on the COVID issue, it is likely on that, that that will be sort of resource rather than capital. However, um, there is a situation, I think, for the executive as a whole, that its, its overall capital budget is probably likely to be of a, a smaller nature next year than, than this year. However, and that has meant that in terms of the draft allocation directly to, um, directly to schools uh, and in terms of the capital programme, we are dealing with, a, with an overall smaller budget in education in overall quantum. However, as part of that, um, there have been indications from the Department of Finance that they are looking, uh, for example, to try to supplement that through RRI. And as part of that, there will be uh, part of our bid for next year is not simply where we are in terms of the mainstream baseline capital build, but also what can be provided from a capital point of view for RRI. That is likely particularly to concentrate on additional um, needed sort of quick intervention in terms of special needs education. But you're right in terms of the situation that where we can move uh, in cases in terms of porta cabins, etc., to more permanent structures, it's better. I suppose the only caveat I would add to that is anybody who's been around schools. What is now provided in terms of porta cabin is light years away with what would have been the case um, when um, either the member opposite or myself would have been at. at oh, sorry? Yeah, I, I know the, the member opposite might have, dream, might have dreamed of the prospect of porta cabins, but what I would say is I think some of us have a slightly 
uh, maybe old fashioned attitude of, of what we see within that. The, the modern sort of mobile classrooms that, that are provided are tend to be of very high quality, but obviously the aim is as much as possible to move towards permanent structure. I, you know, I would simply make the point in a more general sense that um, it is the case that in terms of capital build, if there was both the capacity within the system to deliver it you know, from the point of view of the, of the industry and the finance, there is always at least twice as much that could be done in terms of capital build in that regard. And as with anything else, it's quite often, as with education as with other things, it's about choosing probably between good projects rather than choosing between good and bad in that regard. I call William Humphrey. Minister for his answers so far. Minister, thank you for the visit to the excellent Springfield Primary School last week. The school that in 2005 only 67 pupils, now over 200. The school that has uh, had an extension and it's no longer big enough. So can I, can I ask the Minister to consider that school in terms of any future investment for a new building? Can I ask the Minister then, in, in response to this question, what flexibilities do schools have in terms of their class size and numbers? There is a considerable. I mean, first of all, I was delighted to be at Springfield during the week, and I think the joy that was there. I mean, both I, I would value the professionalism of the staff, but also the joy that was there in terms of returning pupils uh, showed actually the direct benefits of face-to-face -face, face teaching. And I congratulate the school on the level of success that it has had. Uh, you know, any I suppose directly speaking on the COVID situation. Um, does give, uh, I suppose, has got to be class size, got to be with regard to health and safety requirements. Um, within post primary, in practical subjects, there is flexibility provided, the necessary assessments are carried out. Uh, and strictly speaking, while there is a limitation in terms of what is there in the early years of primary, there is more flexibility in terms of the limit on P5 to P7. Now, we know that, um, that within particularly years one to four, smaller class size can have a positive impact on outcome. And so the law in that circumstances requires that classes for youngest children are kept to a maximum of 30. So flexibility in post-primary tends to be around issues such as science, art and design and PE. Um, and those have been in place, that level of flexibility, since 2004. And those have been unchanged. Um, there is, I think, as regards class sizes, in excess of 20 pupils, and up to a maximum of 26, uh, and the different bits for years 12, uh, sorry, 8 to 10 and 11 to 12. In the further practical subjects, such as home economics, music and technology and design. And I think some of that can also mean uh, an opportunity to ensure then that uh, schools are able to use their budgets as effectively as possible, sometimes the division uh, on that. So there is a level of, of um, flexibility, but I suppose what remains paramount is the health and safety of pupils. So that is something that any school's board of governor must be uh, content with that any practical arrangements reflect that. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, they say hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, given the uh, level of uh, infection in classrooms when schools are opened, and also the huge numbers of pupils that had to isolate, if the Minister could go back now, would he do anything different in terms of the, the classroom sizes? Would he have put extra resources in, or maybe split the sizes of classrooms if possible? On it, we did not have huge impact in, in relation to that. It was a very similar position to what happened elsewhere. And I make no apology for trying to ensure that we get the maximum number of pupils in. Now, you know, the reality is that in terms of class sizes, there has been flexibility, indeed, has been said to all schools, the opportunity, and some schools have been able to use this, that where they can split classes, where they can use extra space, um, and indeed some schools have used this. Probably the principal constraint on that is from a teaching point of view that if we simply disperse large numbers of children across the overall piece, uh, then uh, there will be an issue around uh, the number of, of teachers that could be available to be able to teach that. It's, it's simply not an effective way of, of teaching. There will be barriers because of the sheer volume of substitutes that are there. And I know a number of schools, particularly at primary level at the moment, are having difficulty uh, even getting substitute teachers in. So there is a, a level of restriction within that. Um, and, uh, but obviously, I'm always very keen to take any um, lectures from the member opposite on the basis of hindsight. Moving on, I call Martina Anderson. Question number four. Thank the member for her question. Uh, Ardna Shee School in the Foyle constituency was announced under a major capital works call and is currently planning with an approved business case of £33.92 million. The school is due on site in the summer of this year. There are three projects, as well as the major capital works, there are three projects progressing under the second call 
to the School Enhancement Programme, SEP2. Uh, these projects are the Chapel Road Primary School, uh, the Greenhaw Primary School and Holy Child Primary School. Each of these projects will see an investment of up to £4 million each in improving their school. There are also, in addition to that, uh, that directly through the schools, four voluntary youth service schemes that received capital funding of £4.5 million uh, under the two uh, youth calls that have been made. Gowan Buigas, Les Janaira, Astolf Fragra. Thank the Minister for, for his answer. Minister, as you know, the finance, finance Minister has made social value a mandatory component of procurement contracts. So, can you confirm that within those contracts that will be coming on stream, that there will be social value, that there will be social clauses in the procurement contracts, and that will be an integral part of the capital funding for Derry? Certainly, we'll, with uh, regard to any contracts, we'll comply with what the position is across the executive as a whole, so there wouldn't be any particular issue with that. In terms of the detail of what will be in contracts, uh, I'm probably not in a position directly to, to comment on those. But obviously, I think across the executive, we want to ensure that we produce a consistent approach to that. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Just when we're talking about major capital projects, I'd be very keen to hear from you the rollout of Fresh Start and how well that's um, performing across Northern Ireland, because it does seem to be extremely slow at the moment. Well, as the member will be aware, and it was something I think that was tackled um, originally even in the last mandate, uh, one of the issues in terms of Fresh Start, we're confident that the full amount will, will ultimately be spent. One of the issues was that, I suppose, if you go back historically in terms of Fresh Start, and we, we'll write to the, minute, the member in terms of some of the detail of that, was that I suppose this was something that was largely agreed at prime ministerial level without Treasury really wanting a penny being spent. And that meant that, that when it came to the detail of both predecessor and myself, and indeed um, successors of discussions with um, Her Majesty's Government, there was a range of conditions that were put in. First of all, that anything had to be a completely new project. So, for example, somewhere like, like Park Hall Integrated, although it had been announced at that stage, couldn't then avail of fresh start money. Secondly, it had to be a complete new build so that uh, SEP was effectively knocked out of the, the picture. Uh, and also schools that, for instance, would have not necessarily fitted it exactly within the integrated uh, status, but had a, uh, a high level of mixing. They call it the small number of super mixed schools were also excluded. Uh, but also particularly that at that stage there was a bar on spend between years. That has been something which was successfully negotiated, um, first of all, by way of the confidence and supply arrangement, which has been continued. So there is a, a level of progression that is there. That will mean that the, uh, the level of funding will have a certain level of peaks and troughs within it, but we're confident that the overall 500 mil will, will, will be able to be absorbed within the full 10-year period. Moving on, I call Sean Lynch. Chair. Question six. Um, yes, actually, it's five round six. On that regard. But that that were occurring five. So currently, BTEC qualifications through the medium of Irish are, are facilitated by a contractual arrangement between CCEA and the awarding organisation Pearson. Towards the end of 2019, Pearson awarding organisation had given notice of their intention to end this agreement and no longer provide the qualifications. While CCEA continued its discussions with Pearson about this decision, uh, the school which was offering those, uh, these BTECs uh, was advised to consider and identify alternative qualifications. However, unfortunately, in the past couple of weeks, Pearson has confirmed its intention to withdraw uh, from the agreement, withdrawing Level 3 qualifications in September 2021 and Level 2 qualifications in September 22. Pearson's decision has been taken in the context of a significant change to all Level 3 BTECs this year. Pearson 2020, 2010 BTECs are being withdrawn fully across the UK in September 2021, and the new style 2016 BTECs will be the only BTECs available to any school, whether that be in the medium of English or Irish. These uh, new style BTECs introduce external assessment units, making them more like A-levels in their assessment and arrangements. I would point out the CCEA provides a range of applied A-level qualifications uh, and are available in the medium of Irish. A, thir a total of 13 applied A-levels are offered by CCEA. Other uh, qualifi vol uh, vocational qualification providers may wish to make their qualifications available in Irish, and CCEA has contacted other providers to explore this option. 
CCEA will continue to explore what further actions might be possible to address this matter. And allow the member a brief supplementary. I get to ask Colin Coley and thank the Minister for his answer. I'm sorry for trying to confuse you, Minister. But I think what I've asked you to do is just step up your engagement with the qualifying bodies to ensure that these qualifications are there for Irish medium students. The issue is that I suppose there's two aspects to this, and obviously the direct engagement is, is with CCA through Pearson. Pearson are the only group that, that offers directly the BTEX on that basis. And I suppose as an awarding organisation, we have no means to directly compel them to do certain things. They could withdraw entirely from the Northern Ireland market. Uh, we want to make sure there are no particular barriers uh, to that. But there are, as indicated, both through direct, um, and I suppose it is not helpful whenever there is a narrowing of choice, but there are a number of awarding organisations which also then provide alternative vocational qualifications. CCA is working with those, and CCA itself will be stepping up to the mark to uh, provide uh, qualifications as well. But the problem is, I suppose, we're, we're very much in the one boat as regards Pearson, as regards uh, BTEC. And that is the end of our period for listed questions. And we now have 15 minutes of topical questions to the Minister of Education. And I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The outpouring of pain and anger in response to the heinous murder of Sarah Everard and in relation to male violence against women and girls has been palpable. Can I ask the Education Minister if he agrees that standardised relationship and sexuality education is fundamental to promoting appropriate behaviour and to preventing serious sexual offences against women and girls, and what action he has taken to implement the Gillen Review recommendations, including a school sexual offences awareness campaign? Well, from that point of view, we're working closely indeed. I met on Thursday specifically on the issue. I mean, first of all, I would join. Uh, with the member in both condemning and expressing my horror at the uh, what appears to be brutal murder of Sarah Everard, um, and I think that it is a clear sign of the of terrible uh, criminal action to which too many women have been subject to, and I think we all stand in solidarity um, on that issue. Can I say specifically with regards to the Gillen administration, the Gillen report? There are a number of aspects of that which relate, uh, and there's a interconnection particularly between education and justice. Uh, and so last Thursday um, the Justice Minister and myself had a, a meeting to discuss the issues around the implementation uh, of those issues. That relates both in terms of what is taught within the classroom, uh, it also relates to issues around I matters, around what uh, provision can be made in terms of the CCA hub on RSE, uh, and also uh, work that is ongoing in preparing up um, teacher training on, on that issue. We did have a productive meeting, and our two departments will continue to work together to try to uh, ensure that there is full implementation of the, of the Gillen report. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his update. And can I ask the Education Minister further to his meeting with Justice Minister Naomi Long? Will he review the minimum content order to ensure all fundamental matters such as consent are included in standardised relationship and sexuality education in schools? It is the case, I think, that um, in terms of being directly prescriptive on the curriculum, we do have a, uh, a loose uh, sorry, a situation in which uh, the Northern Ireland curriculum is not prescriptive, and that kind of an advantage as well in terms of flexibility and agility and ability to take on orders. But directly speaking, as part of that meeting, we have agreed, certainly for my officials and the justice officials, to work together on that. And issues around, for example, the issue of consent, I think, is, is critical in terms of education on that front. Um, and secondly, the, uh, amongst others, the issue of trying to break cycles of, of abuse, particularly domestic abuse, because we also know. That one of the added problems is that, that those who have experienced abuse as a young child um, have a greater propensity to be involved with abuse at a, a later age, so it is important that that is the case. It is the point that, that in terms of imposing direct curriculum changes on any subject under the, under the current legislative position would require a change in primary legislation, but I would believe that schools should be in a position to step up to the remark on these crucial issues. And I think we have all got to realise as well, particularly from the justice point of view, that we are in a fast-moving environment. And so the issues which may seem um, tangential at the moment may become very central in, in a year or two's time to come. So there has got to be that level of flexibility to be able to meet and to ensure then that we create as safe an environment as possible for everyone in society. 
I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, many parents uh, of children from P4 and above uh, are still very much in the dark in terms of when the children will be able to return uh, to schools to face to face teaching. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of interest around the executive meeting uh, tomorrow. Uh, what stance will the minister be taking as he enters into that executive meeting? Will he be urging his ministerial colleagues uh, to ensure that our children can be taken back into school as soon as possible? Certainly, look, there will be wider discussion within the executive uh, tomorrow. I would have preferred if we had been in the position that decisions could be made earlier, but we are where we are. Uh, last week, we were able to agree uh, that for P1s to P3 pupils and also um, those of preschool age, that there would be no interruption to their education. That was an important step forward. But I think we only reach um, something closer no to normality when we have all students back, and particularly for those at primary level. And I can understand, particularly those at primary level, will see a situation in which they are seeing perhaps a younger sibling heading into school and a level of confusion as to why they are not. So I think it is important that tomorrow we bring a level of certainty. I will certainly be pushing for that uh, return as soon as possible in line with, with whatever public health mitigations will need to be put in place. But I think both from an academic point of view, from the point of view of where families are at, but also from the point of view of the mental health and well-being of, of young people, I think it is critical that we get that return to face-to-face -face teaching as soon as is practically possible. Gary Middleton for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that response. Obviously, Minister, we hear from a lot of uh, teachers and school leaders who uh, want that clarity uh, to be able to move from remote learning into face-to-face, -face, but obviously they need as much time uh, between that as possible. So I join with him in urging all the other parties who do a lot of shouting uh, if they would uh, support our young people, our students, and getting back into school. And do you have a question? And, uh, and, and ensuring that uh, we can do so in a safe manner. That would have been, I suppose, like the old sort of GCSE or A level with the words discuss at the end of it, I suppose, in that, in that regard. But look, it's, it's undoubtedly the case. I would like to see a situation, and I hope that the executive will be able to unite around positions where all of us can actually value education and the role of our, our young people. I have to say as well, it is also important as we look uh, towards our young people that while the focus, for instance, has been on schools, uh, I'm acutely aware, for example, of a phased return in terms of generic youth services, also important, uh, and also particularly for as it obviously concentrates in areas where there is a level of disadvantage, that we see a very rapid return uh, in terms of child-centred activities, in terms of Sure Start will be critical as well. And I hope that the executive, in considering all these things, will make the, uh, our young people a priority as we hold that discussion tomorrow. Call Alex Easton. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister for an update on a potential new school build for Hollywood Primary School? Well, I thank the member for the and the, had the in the past have been at, at Hollywood Primary. As part of this, there isn't anything currently that is uh, proposed for Hollywood Primary. It was not successful uh, on any of the previous calls. What I would say is that, that in terms of a need for new build, the aim would be that later on uh, in this year, there would be a fresh call in terms of major capital works. Uh, under those circumstances, it requires, first of all, the managing authority to agree that Hollywood or indeed any other school goes forward for that. Those schools are then evaluated and then, as part of that, um, are ranked according to then the level of support. So there will be that opportunity for Hollywood and others to apply there. I would also hope that also within the next year there will be a further call for school enhancement programme, which particularly for quite often for some primary schools may be the, the best placed uh, route within that. Call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, Minister, does your department ever look at other types of funding uh, rather than just capital funding for new potential new school bills? Well, look, I think from that point of view, if there's any opportunities for us to draw in additional money, I suppose if it, if it is a new build, then it's by its definition capital money. However, as I indicated, I think previously, there's sometimes we have different streams of capital money. So uh, within that, obviously, we operate uh, both major uh, new builds. We also then look at uh, school enhancement programme. We look at minor works. And also within the, uh, outside of the directly baseline money, as indicated earlier, we can also make a bid in for RRI money on that, on that basis. What I would say to the, the member in terms of, and there's the opportunity for schools to apply in different so quite often for particularly a primary school, uh, because a major capital build will also involve, will tend to be a much longer process tends to be a much more expensive process and, for example, will have to do, as 
the member knows, for example, for something like um, Central Integrated, where it will require as part of that a site search to be done. So it, it will take a longer process. School enhancement programme can spend up to four million within that. So there's nothing to stop any school when the different streams are being announced uh, of applying for either or both. Obviously, effectively, it can only benefit from one or other within a period of time. I call Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, Portadown College is an educational institution, is a jewel in the crown in Upper Ban in Portadown. However, its current building has long passed its best with significant infrastructure issues affecting its ability to provide educational excellence. A scheme for, uh, proposed for a new bill was proposed as far back as 2006, with a debate in this House in 2009 where the Education Minister, Katrina Ryan, said it is estimated that the replacement school will be completed by 2012-2013. Can, member come to this question? Can the Minister give us an update as to the provision? Again, at present, there is there's no direct plans to do that. I should say as well, whenever assessments are being made in terms of capital build, primary and post-primary are on separate lists whenever assessment is being done. So I suppose I can give one assurance that, that to the member and the, the previous member that there won't be a direct competition between Hollywood Primary and Portadown College on that, on that basis. What is the case is that I think previously, whenever in the last round, um, Portadown College I think was ranked 15 amongst the post-primary schools. Uh, at that stage, I think there was a high level of assessment given uh, on the basis of where mergers were taking place. And I think that what that did do was it had a level of disadvantage to schools which were not involved in a merger. But one of the advantages of the previous um, occasion has been that, as a result of that announcement, half a dozen schools have then been taken effectively off the list. It means that whenever a new capital build um, call is being made, the Portadown and others will effectively have some potential rivals for that money have been removed from that and will be able to bid uh, within that. I, I would indicate that, unfortunately, the situation of a promise being made in 2006 around there is not unique. What was the case at that stage was there was an expectation of, um, of finance in terms of capital simply going up and up and up, and then we had the, the crash. And for a lot of schools, they were given a promise, which then had to be effectively withdrawn. Let me give the, the member one assurance that certainly, from my point of view, if we reach a point where it's put it down, Hollywood, or wherever is announced on a capital list, it will happen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. I am sure he will agree with me that the need was identified back in 2006 for a new build on this location. The issues have got worse. The infrastructure has got worse. Will the Minister agree to visiting Portadown College with myself to look at first hand about ways in which we can see the need for urgent investment? I am always uh, very keen to be able to visit schools, and I will be happy if the Member is sending an invitation to come to Portadown College. I think it is important sometimes to see at first hand what the particular issues uh, are. I think to some extent it has maybe been one of the restrictions that we have had out of, out of COVID that the opportunity to be around schools um, has been greatly reduced as particularly hopefully restrictions ease, uh, then I think that will give greater opportunities. And I will be very happy to see, from the, uh, see at first hand the issues surrounding Portadown. Again, I would say there is no lack of willingness to provide uh, support for schools, the one obviously constraint will be what is available in terms of budget, and as such, on any occasion, any capital call will tend to be a competitive process. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And can I follow on from my colleague uh, Gary Middleton in relation to, uh, I suppose, getting children back to school? There's been much. Uh, public opinion, uh, whether it be public, political, or indeed teachers, offering opinions in relation to what is best for children. But can I ask the Minister what he believes is best for children, given there have been so many different iterations suggested by different politicians over the last number of months, and what he believes has actually would, would be best for the children in terms of their education and indeed their mental health? Look, I, I want to see children. I have already made it very clear that I want to see children directly in school, getting face-to-face -face teaching, and I want that as soon as as is practical, given sort of the public health constraints that, that are there. I, I suppose as part of that, while quite often the focus is on the academic level of, of, of catch-up, and there is no doubt, despite the brilliant work that has been done by schools, by teachers, by parents, and by students themselves in terms of remote learning, is at best a, a secondary substitute for that face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, to some extent, probably academic catch-up is something that is probably easier to put a level of investment in to do. What is more difficult, and I think uh, is something, again, the reason why we need to see the children back as soon as possible, 
is the mental health and well-being of our young people. You know, I saw it certainly at first hand amongst the very young children at Springfield during the week. Simply the biggest single thing for particularly those P3s was actually seeing some of their friends who they haven't seen during the, the period of lockdown. Having that, that opportunity for a level of interaction, and I, it would concern me the long-term damage that, is, that has already taken place in terms of mental health and, and well-being. So I think for a range of reasons, um, including also for their physical health as well, I think the sooner we can get back to a situation in which all children are directly within schools, the better. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister for Education. I ask the members to take their ease for a few moments until our next Minister, the Minister of Finance, uh, is ready.